You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. My name's Olivia and this is the Y2K podcast. I found a bunch of files on my mum's old laptop. It's 20 year old voicemails between my mum and a friend of hers. Hi Kat. You always know when something's off, don't you? Jess, oh, that feels so great. That was Rachel. She's... <laughs> wow. I feel... Uh empty. Sending you hugs across all the oceans. Oceans of hugs? That's perfect. Y2K. New episode every Friday all through 2020, starting January 3rd. Hi, I'm Annie in Boston. And I'm Johanna from Vienna, Austria, and you just heard the promo for Y2K, that's an audio drama podcast, because sometimes we all just need to take a break from all those macabre things and might want to listen to a fictional podcast about love and long-distance friendship, just like ours, Annie. So yes, go, please, and check it out. Oh, that sounds great. And Johanna and I really want to say thank you for all the lovely messages that we've received after our last episode. Your experiences and signs were just really amazing. Yes, I can say I was deeply touched and please keep them coming. They are really quite some comfort during this rather sad times. A uh, special shout out to Hannah. I loved your story so much. It was beautiful and um, it made me cry. All right, uh, now last week Annie did me the huge favor of telling a story as I truly was unable to get any work done. Thank you, Annie. Please, you did the exact same thing for me when my mom died. It's how we do things. So this week, as promised, I will finish the tale of the Austrian serial killer Jack Unterweger. Well, alleged serial killer, that is. Oh, alleged. All right. I listen, I really can't wait to hear the end of this, even though I'm pretty sure it's all going to be terrible. But again, I just can't believe this is a case I, I really know almost nothing about. So do you mind giving us a quick recap? Yeah, of course. So if you haven't done so yet, please go and listen to our episode 66 first. That's the first part of the Czech Unterweger case. But for all of you who already listened to it and just need a quick reminder... Jack was convicted to a life sentence after the brutal murder of Margaret Schäfer in 1974. During his time in prison, he started to write poetry, short stories, plays, and even autobiographical novels, which turned him into a darling of the Austrian intellectuals and artists. They petitioned for an early release of the murderer, and this was indeed granted. After 16 years in prison, Jack Unterweger was once more a free man and now rubbing elbows with the Austrian high society. Hindsight is, I know it's always 2020, but it's all so cringeworthy. I know. So, Jack not only appears on TV and gives literary readings in various cities, he's also hired by magazines to write about the red light districts and the demi monde. And so, in 1990, he traveled to Prague, a city <sighs> both Annie and I love very much. Yeah, we love Prague. So Paul and I went on a whim uh, from the UK when we were over visiting family. And I think we only spent three days, but it was early December and the city at Christmas is absolute magic. They set up the most amazingly beautiful Christmas trees in the square near the astronomical clock. And that clock is, it's gorgeous. It's amazing. And I don't know if it's truth or legend, but there's like a story that says that um, once the clockmaker, whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head, he had finished this absolute masterpiece of a clock. He was then blinded so that he could never create a better clock, which is... That's heavy. And then, of course, the story for the golem is from Prague. And uh, we also, my favorite thing was we took a trip to uh, Kutnahora. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But we went to the Sedlak Ossuary, and it's a bone chapel. So it was basically, there was a church, and during the plague, people would take pilgrimage to try to get to this church where they believed they might be healed. But what ended up happening was that all of these people arrived at this tiny church and then died of the plague. So they ended up with just 
an enormous amount of plague victims to take care of. And sometime later on in the 1800s, I think, they hired a woodcarver to just put all the bones in, into like tidy order. And he did that. Um, there were massive, very organized piles of bones, but also these just amazing and elaborate bone chandeliers and bone family crests and artwork and writing in bones. It's amazing. And I will post some photos. I love Prague. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants is actually in Prague. It's called Upalamento. If you ever go to Prague, please go to the restaurant and try the strawberry dumplings. They don't always have them with strawberries, but also other seasonal fruits, as far as I remember. I think I once had them with blueberries, and they are amazing. On sunny days, buy some beer and rent a pedal boat on the Moldau, which is the German name for the river that runs through Prague. Of course, there's so much sightseeing to do, the bridges, the castle, the torture museum. <laughs> I just love to walk around in this beautiful city. I think I have to tell my husband that I want to go there in fall. And one last tip from me to you. If you feel super freaky or maybe if you're a little bit high, Who, me? go and see a play at one of the Black Light theaters. It's incredible. It's so much fun. Oh, nice. I can highly recommend. <laughs> highly. I want to go to there. I don't know if I told you, from where we are going to build our house, it's roughly a two and a half hour drive to Prague. Oh, see, that's amazing. We're going to have to go back one of these times when we visit. We needed more time. Uh, we really did. I would have liked a week there. But I had the best hot chocolate I've ever had in Prague. And I got garnet earrings as an early Christmas present. They're famous for their garnets. And I might have told you all of this before. But uh, if my friends have to deal with my terrible memory, which means I tell the same stories over and over again, then our listeners can handle it once in a while, too. <laughs> So, this episode is not about us and our love for Prague and Czech food and beer, but it is about Czech Unterweger and the time when he traveled to Prague to write about the life of sex workers in the back then still Czechoslovakian city. Oh, of course, that's right. So, Slovakia and the Czech Republic used to be one country, Czechoslovakia, and I kept forgetting that when we were there, because when I was in school it was Czechoslovakia. So, I did remember that it used to be the capital of Bohemia, though, when I sang Bohemia. Bohemian Rhapsody the entire time we were there, which I know my husband and brother-in-law loved. But uh, yeah, Czechoslovakia is now the Czech Republic. So we are here on the border to, to the Czech Republic. And old people here in the area still call it Bohemia, so Böhmen. Do they? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, up until the 1st of January 1993, they formed the Federal Republic of Czechoslovakia, and nowadays they are two separate countries. Prague is still the capital of Czech Republic, and Bratislava is the capital of Slovakia. I have a fun fact for you. <laughs> <laughs> Vienna and Bratislava are the two closest capitals in Europe, if you don't count Vatican City and Rome. Oh. I think driving from Vienna to Bratislava is roughly 67 kilometers or 42 miles, and I think it's 54 kilometers or 33.5 miles as the crow flies. So you can take a boat on the Danube, it's called the Twin City Liner, and it takes you from one city to the other in only 75 minutes. Oh, yes, please. And I've never been to Bratislava yet, can you believe it? Well, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm down. I think the two closest capitals in the world, again obviously not counting Rome and Vatican City, are Kinshasa and Brazzaville, because that's a distance of 35 kilometers and 21 miles. Well, the, the more you know. This is... <laughs> Who knows when this information will ever come in handy? Probably never. You never know. But maybe one day one of you out there will find himself in a saw like situation <laughs> and only this knowledge will spare your life. It's possible. Not likely, let's... but possible. Yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry for swaying from our person of interest. So Jack Unterweger traveled to Prague in September of 1990. In the early morning of 15th of September 1990, on the riverbanks just outside of the city of Prague, a body was discovered. It was the body of a young woman, naked except for some knee-high grey stockings. She was lying on her back, the legs spread apart and her whole body showed several injuries, but especially on her head and her neck. When the police searched the surrounding area, they found the dead woman's clothing and her wallet with her IDs. The name of the victim was Blanka Pokova, a 20-year-old woman, married and mother of one son, I think. 
She had last been seen the night before when she was out with friends enjoying a few drinks in a bar close to the Wenzel Square in Prague. Her friends wanted to leave, but she decided to stay and was last seen talking to a man in his 40s. Her friends described him as a well-dressed foreigner. The coroner determined that Blanca died from strangulation. Even though the police started to search for the well-dressed foreigner immediately, he could not be found and Blanca's murder stayed unsolved. One month later, so in October of 1990, Czech Unterweger was sent to Graz, that's uh, in Styria in Austria. Once more, he was sent there for yet another magazine to research for yet another article about the red light district in this Styrian city. On 26th of October 1990, a woman goes missing in Graz. This time, it's a 41-year-old sex worker named Brunhilde Massa. On 5th of January 1991, her body is found in a wooded area near Gratkorn in Styria. So that's a 22-minute drive south from Graz. The naked body that was discovered by a couple of children is that of Brunhilde Massa, who had been missing for over two months. Her body shows many injuries and the cause of death could not be determined. Oh, that's awful that children found her. I mean, it's awful for anybody to find a body, but especially children. It's never like a retired police detective on a stroll with his bloodhound, right? It's always yeah. like a group of children. But talk about knowing that just the precise moment your childhood ended. And it's never as adventurous as the boys from Stand By Me imagined it to be, I guess. No, no, never. So five days before Brunhilde is found, so on 31st of December 1990, another woman is found dead, this time in Vorarlberg, which is the most western Austrian state, and it borders to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. A man is out in the woods with his German shepherd when the dog finds something. It is the body of Heide Marie Hammerer, a sex worker from Bregenz, and she had last been seen on 5th of December 1990, and her body was in such a bad state of decomposition that the doctor or coroner who had been called to the scene had to throw up in front of his car. <gasps> no. Let's hope it was a doctor, just to certify the death and not a coroner because i watch a lot of ncis and ducky would never be sick at a crime scene do you watch ncis no but philip loved it yeah it's good stuff so i don't know maybe they just called in like the local podiatrist was the only guy available <laughs> and he was just not prepared yeah. oh seriously though that's that's just awful for everybody especially poor is it heidi marie mm -hmm. yeah were they able to determine the cause of death? Was she like the others? So Heide Marie too had been strangled, but she was not found naked. She had been redressed after her death and some red fibers were found on her clothes. Oh, redressing a body is always, it's creepy to me. And I don't know, it's interesting because it sounds like sometimes he posed them for shock value and other times it seems like he wanted to spend more time with the bodies after their death. You know, just taking time to dress them again. Yeah, yeah. Redressing is as bad as lingering and having some snacks at a house. Ugh. Yeah. Hate it. Snacks and an axe. So, unfortunately, there are still so many more victims. Elfriede Schrempf goes missing on 7th of March 1991, and two days after her disappearance, her family receives a disturbing phone call. I don't know the exact content of this call, but it must have been very alarming. Also, the family's number was not listed, but Elfriede had written it down in a little notebook that she used to carry around with her. Her body, or what is left of it, is found almost seven months later, on 5th of October 1991, in a forest 20 kilometers outside of Graz and her notebook was not found with her. Oh no, that's awful. And to call the family? That's really sadistic, isn't it? Yeah, very. Next, sex workers in Vienna also start to disappear. 8th of April 1991, Silvia Zagler goes missing. Her body is found 4th of July 1991 in the Wiener Wald, so that's the huge and dense forest in the west of Vienna. 16th of April 1991, Sabine Moitzi goes missing in Vienna. Her body is found on 20th of May 1991, again in the Wiener Wald. She too was found naked, strangled with one of her own clothing items. She was displayed in a very degrading way. She was lying on her stomach. Her face was turned uh, so that it was like really up in the dirt mm. and her legs were spread apart oh shock value it just it makes you wonder if he had reasons to do this with some of the women and not with others right and yeah. this is getting much closer together now it seems like he's really starting to escalate maybe it was a time issue like that he didn't have time for all of the women to display them or oh, i don't know could be it could it be could but be. then again he he redressed one of them i mean that takes a lot of time 
And it makes you wonder why, you know, did he respect her in some way that he didn't respect the others or what? That's the part of all of this that I'm always so curious about, just how their brains work, because they're so different from us. 28th of April 1991, Regina Prem goes missing. She was married and had a 10-year-old son. And just like in the case of Elfriede Schrempf, her family, or in this case her husband, starts to receive horrible phone calls. A man tells him that he has murdered his wife, that he strangled her, that she was struggling a lot, and that he took photos of her dead body. Oh no, that's awful. I can't even imagine. It's horrible. The caller calls himself the executioner. No. Yeah, and he says he's ordered by no one else but God himself uh, to kill. Uh, that's awful. Uh, yeah, but we have to keep in mind that here the caller could have very well been some sick person who read about the crime and just got a kick out of torturing the family of the victim. I mean, it's possible. It's possible it was the murderer or it was somebody. Cause, you know. Right, because their, their number was listed in this other one. I think so, yeah. Okay. Either way, that's a very good point, but still, these people are just... It's awful. It reminds me of the Bleistift murder, you remember? Yes. They also received some horrible phone calls after after their name was published in the papers. Mm. It's awful. So, Regina's body is only found 16th of April 1992, so almost a year later. It's horrible. It's, yeah. 7th of May 1991, Karen Eroglu goes missing. Her body is discovered 23rd of May 1991 in one of the forests surrounding Vienna. Wow. This is just, this is terrible. It gets so much worse. Okay. Jack Unterweger, the man who was convicted for murdering a woman in 1974, mind you. He is hired by an Austrian radio station to interview sex workers in Vienna and he has to ask them about the murders and if they feel unsafe now that so many of their colleagues disappear. Wow. So I wish you could see the expression on my face right now because Mm -hmm. it's just, just a very open mouth. I cannot believe that this... Wow. Wow. Okay. And on 3rd of June 1991, Czech Unterweger is hired by the Austrian Broadcasting to conduct an interview with, and you can't make this up, conduct (sighs) an interview with the head of the criminal department as well as with the lead investigator for the unsolved murders of the Viennese sex workers. (sighs) Wow. Talk about getting yourself involved in the case. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. The interviews are part of a TV report called, quote, The Fear of the Horse, unquote. Okay. I mean, that's one title they could have gone with. I mean, it's the early 90s. So the police was absolutely certain that a serial killer was on the prowl and they didn't even know yet about the murder of Blanka Pokova and they also didn't connect yet the murders in Graz and in Bregenz. So it was only Mm. they were only aware of the murders in Vienna at that time. Sure. So what Jack Unterweger didn't know... That one of the police officers from Salzburg, who had investigated the murder of Marika Horvath in 1973, had kept a very close eye on Unterweger ever since he had his early release from prison. I talked about Marika Horvath in our first part uh, episode of this case. She had been strangled with her tights in Salzburg, and an investigator had suspected Unterweger of being the murderer after he discovered a similar MO as in the murder of Margaret Schaefer. I, I don't know if you remember... We talked about it briefly. Yeah. Unfortunately, a female friend had given Unterweger an alibi, and so he could never be convicted. But the now-retired police officer had followed all the cases of the murdered sex workers from Vienna, Bregenz and Graz, and he was absolutely certain that this had Unterweger's handwriting all over it. So he contacted his Viennese colleagues and informed them of his suspicion. Yes, this is exciting. Yeah, I think this is exciting, but it's also a good moment to take a quick break for this week's sponsor, Podcorn. Especially if you are new to podcasting, finding the right sponsor for your show can be, let's say, quite overwhelming. Podcorn is there to help podcasters to connect with sponsors. You can easily find companies your audience would be interested in. You can set your own rates and choose how you would like to incorporate the sponsor into your podcast. From a simple ad to a more elaborate discussions, interview segments, or giveaways. Podcorn gave us the opportunity to work with interesting brands and it makes the process really easy. Choose a company you would like to work with, send in your proposal and chat with your sponsor directly in your online workroom. 
And the most important part for us podcasters, you don't give up any rights to your creative work. Podcorn is there to support you and your podcast. If you are interested in connecting with brands via Podcorn, just click the link in this episode's description and it will take you to www.podcorn.com where you can set up an account for free to start browsing all available sponsorships. All right, so the retired police officer had a hunch and informed his colleagues. Uh, he said that they should keep an eye on Jack Unterweger, he might be the man they were looking for. And the police really starts to investigate him, but they cannot find any evidence that he is indeed the serial killer they are looking for. So Jack Unterweger is able to leave Austria on 10th of June 1991 to go on a five-week-long work trip, and I have work in quotation marks, to Los Angeles. Okay, this is strange to me because I didn't think that you could get a work visa here if you had any criminal background, certainly not a murder conviction. I mean, I think even if you're busted with cannabis on you, you can't get a visa to enter the United States. But now I'm going to have to look into that because I, I could be completely wrong. Or maybe he got special permission because he was a cause celeb or something because, I mean, bands tour here all the time, right, that have definitely had possession. Yeah. Charges. No, you're right. You're right. You can't get a visa. But I guess the system was maybe not as up to date and as readily available in the early 90s. Oh, definitely not. And he probably didn't mention it. And I'm pretty sure that he came on a tourist visa as he was not earning money in the US. Uh, he was just there for research. Uh, gotcha. Because he was sent there by yet another magazine to research the situation of sex workers in the City of Angels. Annie, I think you know in which hotel he stayed during his visit. Yes, this is the one fact I know about this, is that Jack Unterweger stayed at the Cecil. And you might think, hmm, that name sounds familiar, and you are absolutely right, because the Cecil gained some notoriety through the very mysterious death of Elisa Lamb in 2014. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but for those of you who don't know the case, we're going to be doing an episode just on the Cecil Hotel in the not-too-distant future. It's a whole episode. It's the hotel that American Horror Story Hotel is based on, and it's really just got an incredibly tragic history. Yes, I'm so excited. I'm so up for an episode about it. Uh, maybe we can combine it with the Chelsea Hotel in New York. Yes, one on each coast. Yeah. There are so many reasons why the Cecil was pretty much the inspiration for American Horror Story. And allegedly for Barton Fink. Oh, yes. Okay, back to Jack Unterweger. He is in LA and stays at the Cecil and does some research for yet another magazine article about prostitution. I mean... That's the only thing he seems to be writing about. It's very bizarre to me. After he left prison. When he was in prison, he wrote children's stories, but... That's also very disturbing. <laughs> That's, the whole thing is just wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. What a weird coincidence, though. Jack has yet barely stepped a foot in the city, and already women start to disappear. No. You would think that surely he'd be better behaved. Yeah, no. Uh, 19th of June, 1991. Shannon Axley goes missing. She is found the next day by Girl Scouts in an empty lot. Cause of death? Strangulation with her own bra. Oh, those poor girls. All of them. 28th of June, 1991. Irene Rodriguez goes missing. She was last seen by her roommate. The 33-year-old is found only two days later in a parking lot. Cause of death? Strangulation with her own bra. 3rd of July, 1991. Sherry Ann Long goes missing. She was last seen on her way to Sunset Boulevard to look for customers. Her body is found on 11th of July, 1991 on Coral Canyon Road in the Malibu Hills. Cause of death? Strangulation with her own bra. Wow. That's a lot of murders with the same M.O. in one area in a pretty short period of time. He's really getting cocky now. He's losing yeah. control. Yeah. So a while after Jack Unterweger returns to Vienna, he is finally interrogated by the Viennese police. He, of course, denies having anything to do with the murders, but cannot come up with alibis and information of his whereabouts for the nights in question. Finally, also the police in Styria and Vorarlberg realize that their murder cases might indeed be connected to the murder cases in Vienna, and in January of 1992, Unterweger is interrogated for these crimes as well. And again, he does not have alibis, but it can be proven that he was in the area during the time of the murders. 
By the time the police is closing in on Unterweger, his former advocates start to distance themselves from their former example prisoner. <laughs> I bet. All of a sudden, they don't want to be seen with him anymore. They don't want to be connected to him in any way. Yeah, who would have ever have thought that the vicious murderer would be a vicious murderer? True. It's a shocking. What a surprise. I can't kill the police. <sighs> yeah. Finally, on 13th of February 1992, a warrant is issued for Unterweger's arrest. But it's too late. Why? Warned by newspaper articles of the imminent arrest, Unterweger no. is able to flee Austria. No. Yeah. He's on his way to Paris with his new girlfriend, the 18-year-old Bianca. He had met the young student in November of 1991 in the Viennese discotheque Take 5, which uh, is an infamous club in the inner city. And no, it doesn't exist anymore and we cannot go there any. Put your vinyl pants down. It closed six years ago. Uh, that's all right. So did the window where I looked good in vinyl pants. That also <laughs> slammed shut about six years ago. So... Did Bianca know that Jack was a convicted murderer? Okay, so I read several of her interviews and she says that when she met him, she had no idea who the, she called him a uh, tiny old man <laughs> was. <laughs> that creepy old guy at the disco. <laughs> I used to always get, I was like a magnet for creepy old guy at the disco. Anytime we went to a club, my friends would put bets on like, which guy would hit on me first looking at the bar. It was pretty funny. But yeah, <laughs> creepy old guy magnet right here. <laughs> So she had no idea who he was, but uh, apparently he confessed the murder of Margaret Schaefer during the first conversation. But she didn't know that he was the suspect in several other murder cases. But the one was okay? Well, it's just the one murder. She says about the relationship that he was a good listener, that he was generous, but also extremely jealous, which she found weird because he was the one cheating on her constantly, and that he wanted total control over her life. He estranged her from her family and from her friends, so which is typical grooming behavior. Mm -hmm. I read that then uh, she then went to Switzerland to work in a bar, and when the police was close to arrest Jack Unterweger, he drove to her with a gun, and there he told her that he's innocent and that he was going to commit suicide. And that was when Bianca suggested to flee. No. Bianca, why? No. Lots of grooming and abuse. Well, and a whole lot of rose-tinted glasses, I think. Hmm. Yeah. You didn't watch Bojack Horseman yet, right? No, I haven't. I need to. And I love the quote when the one girlfriend of Bojack Horseman says, when you're wearing rose-tinted glasses, all the red flags just look like flags. So the couple make their way to Paris and there they purchase airplane tickets to New York and from there they go to Miami and they use Unterweger's credit cards to pay for it. That was back in the good old days when you couldn't cancel a card in a matter of seconds and nothing was online. They arrive in Miami and Unterweger contacts another lover, a woman named Manuela, and asks her to send money and Austrian newspapers to Miami, which she does. But thank God Manuela's employer notices that something is going on and he informs the police. Thank dog, someone did. My goodness. Mm. And when Bianca goes to Western Union to pick up the money transfer, the police are already waiting for them and they arrest Bianca and check who is waiting outside. And it's the 27th of February 1992, which is also my 13th birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> So Unterwege and his girlfriend are brought back to Austria and Jack goes to prison for his pre-trial. The thing is, there is no convincing evidence that connects Jack Unterwege to the in total 11 murders. No witnesses, no sperm, the murderer always had used condoms, no items belonging to the victims are found in Unterwege possessions. The investigators have nothing but the fact that he was always close by when the murders happened. Oh, man. I think in the US you don't need... um. How do you call it? You you don't need really to have absolute proof that somebody... Sure. Yeah, you can have more circumstantial evidence. Yeah, yeah. It's different here. Mm. Okay. Then they find two things. So first they can identify the red fibers that uh, were found on Heide Marie Hammerer's body and they match the fabric of a red scarf that is found in Czech's apartment. And the police finds a hair that belongs to Blanka Bokova, the victim from Prague, in a car that used to belong to Czech Unterweger. Of course, Czech Unterweger still denies all accusations at that point. 
Of course he does. A young lawyer named Astrid contacts Jack Unterweger in prison after she reads about a suicide attempt. She wants to support the accused emotionally because she feels a little bit bad for him as the media treats him as if he's already convicted of the murders. She feels bad that nobody seems to give him the benefit of a doubt. So she writes to him and he contacts her and he invites her to visit him in prison and she does. The former darling of the high society is very pale and he's no more in expensive white suits and he has no more expensive jewelry. He sits in front of her with a t-shirt with holes in it and Astrid feels so sorry for him. But she also feels some kind of attraction when Jack Unterweger starts to flirt with her. And so, you know, she falls for him and after a few weeks she breaks up with her boyfriend and from then on she only lives to be there for Jack Unterweger. Oh no, it's okay. I <sighs> I don't get it. No, no. It's, it's the same story over and over again. I don't get it. It's a certain, you have to have a certain sort of personality trait within you, right? Where it's like the savior complex. Like you feel like you're the one that understands and you're the one that yeah. can fix it and heal it. But she's, she's uh, still a very well-known and successful lawyer. Nowadays in Austria, and she gives a lot of interviews concerning all yeah. different cases. And she's a tough lady, like she really is. Oh, yeah, there are, yeah. It's, it's, you, I think a lot of times we imagine that these women who fall in love with the worst, most horrible people you can imagine, we always imagine that they're these broken people right with no other option and and that's not the case a lot of them are they're intelligent they come from good families they it's it's really kind of all over the board it's not yeah you can't really necessarily predict it and it it does it baffles it it the mind boggles to me how that would happen but sociopaths are very charming i mean that's mm. kind of the thing isn't it so that's true they're good at it so for two years, Astrid does whatever she can for Jack Unterweger, from washing his dirty clothes to even considering to marry him to make him look more decent during his trial. But Unterweger refuses. Sorry, he refuses to wear the clean clothes or to marry her? <laughs> no, he gladly lets her wash his dirty clothes, but he prefers to stay single. No, like that makes him special. So the trial starts on 20th of April 1994 and media attention is huge everybody's on the edge of their seats. It is a so-called trial of the century here in Austria. How many trials of the century did we already discuss in our episodes? So many. So many. We have to get them all. We'll get them all by the end of this. <laughs> Will the former prison poet be convicted of 11 murders? Jack Unterweger appears in court wearing a dark grey suit, looking very serious, and smiles shyly at the cameras. His opening words, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be here together for the next two months and I don't want to be an actor. I would love to have an atmosphere like in a Viennese coffee house. If you have any questions, just ask and I will answer everything. I have a huge advantage. I don't have anything to hide, as I'm not the murderer. If you catch me in a lie, you can convict me. End quote. Oh, he reminds me of Bundy. So smug. Yeah, he's a lot like Bundy, that's true. Yeah. Ugh. Jack has hired two lawyers, one who is perfectly comfortable in the media spotlight and who tries to change the public opinion for the better, and the other one for factual research. They start the trial by stating that if Unterweger would have been the murderer, then why was there not one hair of his German shepherd found on any of the victims, as dog hair tends to go everywhere? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true. Philip finds Leela's and Jem's hair everywhere in his room in where he's now. The dogs yeah. have never been there, but it's still a very weak argument, I'd say. Yeah, and I think that's partly because of how he lived with his dog. Like, we live with our dogs. They're on our sofas, they're in our beds, they're on our laps, they're with yep. us all the time, right? But do we know if he was like this with his dog? Because a lot of people, their dogs aren't allowed on furniture, their dogs, you know, they don't get into the bed, they have their special place and that's where they, or they just live outside and have a dog house. Yeah. He had to keep those white suits pristine, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm imagining he did not allow... If I walked in the door right now with a white suit on, my heathen puppy would have it torn to shreds and my, <laughs> I'd be bleeding on it within seconds. But yeah, I just imagine he wasn't the type to allow dog hair yeah, to probably. be all over him. You know those people. Like, we all know that one person that has pets, but like, you'd never know it. Yeah. I always look like I've been dragged through a hedge backwards <laughs> by a mob of angry raccoons. 
cartoons. I'm like constantly frazzled and covered in dog hair and it's fine. But that's possible, right? I mean, I think, I don't think it's that much of evidence that they didn't find German Shepherd hair. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) They they reached. It was a, it was a reach. Yeah. Jack Unterweger states that he has alibis for all the crimes, but they are rather weak too. So for seven out of the 11 murders, he reads from his diary. And the diary said that he was spending the night alone, either at his place or in hotel rooms. It's like, dear diary. (laughs) Here I am, alone again. Non-eventful night. Didn't go out and murder anybody. Just stayed home or something like that. I'm I'm just here by myself. Again in the hotel. Definitely not murdering anybody. (laughs) Oh... Uh, For the other four murders, he states that he had phone calls with friends. I think the friends could not be reached to make, to give a testimony about it. It doesn't, it, nothing of that sounds waterproof to me. No, that all sounds like a total lack of an alibi to me. (laughs) I wouldn't say any of that as an alibi. (laughs) What were you doing? I was alone at home. Can anybody (laughs) vouch for that? No. (laughs) That's not an alibi. Oh. I mean, it's all I do, so if anything ever happens, I'm fucked, because it's like, where were you? Home. I'm always home. (laughs) (laughs) But if you don't find my dog's hair at the scene, that's all the proof you need, because I am covered in it. Covered in it. Not only the dog's hair, our hair would go everywhere, too. I really, it's so bad. I look such, I look like such a mad witch right now. It's, it's out of hand, but it's fine. Everything's fine. (laughs) Okay, back to the trial. So a specialist is flown in from the United States and she talks about the knots that were used to strangle the LA victims. She states that the knots are highly unusual and they are almost certainly from the same murderer. And after she examines the knots from the Austrian victims, she comes to the conclusion that all the knots were done by the same person. Oh, interesting. That makes me think of the Rebecca Zahau case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And an Austrian expert talks about Austrian crime statistics. They state that from 1959 to 1994, there were 54 sex workers murdered in Austria, and only eight of those 54 had been taken from the streets, strangled, and then disposed of in a wooded area. And what a coincidence, seven of those eight were the ones that were connected with Jack Unterweger. And last but not least, the Unterweger trial was the first time that DNA analysis was used for a trial in Austria. What can I tell you? The hair found in his car was a perfect match for Blanka Bokova. Oh, listen, this sounds like a lot of evidence against him. Yeah, and of course, Czech Unterweger and his lawyers called his evidence planted. Of course. On 29th of June 1994, after only 40 minutes of deliberation, the jury comes back with their verdict, guilty in nine cases. Good. The prosecution cannot prove the guilt of Jack Unterweger for the murders of Regina Prem and Elfriede Schrempf, but he is sentenced to life in prison. Oh, excellent. Good. Only a couple of hours after the verdict, Jack Unterweger commits suicide in his cell. No. Yeah. So he hangs himself with the cord from his sweatpants, and the knot he uses is identical to the knots he used on the victims, just mirrored. Oh, that is creeptastic right to the very end. I have such mixed feelings on the death by suicide of murderers. It's like, on the one hand, you're saving taxpayer money and families and other victims. I mean, in general, in a, in the broad sense of, of people who mm. do this, you know, families know they'll never get out and kill again, as well as victims, you know, who survive know that they're going to be safe from this person. And since he actually strangled his victims, it's all very eye for an eye in a sort of yeah. satisfying way. But then you also feel like he got off easy, like he didn't actually have to suffer very much as a prisoner or would he have been in one of your super nice prisons? I mean, all of our prisons are rather nice. <laughs> They're pretty nice, yeah. I think he would have gone to Stein again, probably. Yeah, okay. But because he died before the verdict was legally binding, he cannot be considered a convicted serial killer, only an alleged serial killer. Mm. Did he do it? Was he the man who murdered so many women? I'd say it's very, very likely. Oh, 
I agree. And that reminds me of the Aaron Hernandez case. He was a professional football player for the New England Patriots, which is our local football team, and a murderer. And because he died by suicide after he was convicted, but before his appeal was heard, his conviction in the murder of Owen Lloyd was thrown out. And so then what ended up happening was like two years later, I think, the Massachusetts State Supreme Court overturned that and reinstated the conviction. So he's once again a convicted murderer, which I think must be helpful to the victim's family. Yeah. I'm probably never going to cover that case. It's too recent and he has a child. But I believe when they did his autopsy, they found just just CTE. His brain was just really damaged from multiple concussions. And there's some really interesting research into that being a contributing factor to making somebody violent who may be wasn't so violent before. And it really, really makes me hope this is going to sound so strange, but I really hope that when the time comes, whenever that may be, that OJ Simpson's brain gets under the microscope. Like, I want to see what's going on there. I'm so yeah. curious. I was honestly shocked. Shocked is not the right word. Maybe annoyed about all the women who started swooning for Hernandez after the Netflix documentary was released. I just, I always have a really hard time with people standing murderers. It's like, ugh. I know, I know. I haven't watched that documentary yet. I it's need really good. to. Yeah, I well, it's it's Paul's not really into true crime. Like he listens to the podcast because he likes us. He's one of the people who's <laughs> like, I like all the bits that aren't about murder. <laughs> He's not the only one. It's cool, but. Yeah, so, but that's one of the few where I'm like, we should watch this one together because of the Patriots aspect of it. Yeah, he, I think he had a lot of fans even before that series came out when he was just a murderer. True. And uh, we will just never understand that mindset, I think. But yeah, I I agree with you. I, I definitely think Unter Vager did it. Yeah, I think he had to, right? Uh, I think, yeah. In my opinion, it was just all too much to be a coincidence. Yeah. I agree. That was great. Thank you. I had no idea that he had traveled around the world committing these crimes. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it really is. And it's amazing that they were able to link it together. Like, thank yeah. goodness that one, that was that one detective, right, after his initial yeah. conviction that just kept a fucking eye on him, knew he was up to no good because... He wasn't. <laughs> he was up to no good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Do you want me to go first for something good? Yes, please. All right. So uh, I have a recommendation for you all. Friends of ours, uh, Bruce and Susan. Susan, they both listen to the show. Hi. They gave us a really, really nice collar for Opus. It's beautiful. And it's made locally. So I just really want to recommend them. I'll post a link. If you do a search for Cody's Creations, C-O-D-Y-S, uh, she's on Etsy. And I will post a photo of Opus and his snazzy collar and a link because uh, she's a local small business. And I think her collars and leashes are amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my something good. Uh... <laughs> I'd say natural, there's not so much good going on for me right now. It's so hard to find something, right? It's, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess my something good is that today was the town council meeting and we had been waiting for almost three months for it. It's regarding our piece of land for our house that we want to purchase. So that's good news. I just can't be excited about it right now. I just feel like meh about everything right now. But I hope... And I know that over time I will be super happy and excited about it. I know you will be. And just promise me you won't feel guilty if you do feel happy. Because you know that it's what your dad wants more than anything. What both of our parents want more than anything is to see us be happy. So we have to remember it's okay to feel that way. I know. It's just really hard, but I know. Yeah, you need a little time. I think you're probably still very numb. I would imagine you're not feeling much of anything. Apart from pain. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. <laughs> so much. So, anyway, thanks so much for listening, everyone. <laughs> this feels like a weird transition because I feel like I'm turning away from your pain. <laughs> no, oh, please right. do. I'm going to cry. 
<laughs> okay, so let's wrap this up so that we can both uh, get off of this recording and do some crying. Thank you all for listening uh, this week. I hope that everyone listening enjoyed this story as much as I did. If you have just the tiniest bit of spare time and could leave us a review, we would very much appreciate it. It's how strangers find us. Yes, and please tell your friends about us if you think they might be interested in our little podcast here. You can also follow us on Instagram and on Twitter Twitter and uh, what else? Yeah, come join the Facebook group. Just search for Fresh Hell Murder and it'll turn up. It's a really fun, weird group of people and it's just our favorite place on Facebook these days. No drama, no politics. It's a really interesting, diverse group of people from all over the world who I think I would say they're very good at giving each other the benefit of the doubt. It's not it's not yep. a snarky group, right? It's no. like everybody understands that we're all coming from different places. We never had any drama in this. There. No, Never. and we're keeping it that way. And there's even a pinned <laughs> post for like virus memes. So even that's tucked away. And it's great. It's just full of really interesting people from all over the world. It is a goddamn delight. So yeah, come say hi. Also, tell your dogs we said hi. We love them. And not we only do. your dogs. You know the deal. Yeah. All of them. We love them all. And if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.